well, Sam. Welcome. Thank you, Mal. It's Sam, you're here because over the journey, over the years, and this is actually not our first interview, as you just reminded me. We did one, what, a dozen years ago or something along those lines or 10 I'd have, years ago? I'd have to check the year, but I think it might be more it, than it, 10 years ago. It was a classic anyway. <laughs> so the reason, the reason you're here is because over the years, I've found you to be one of the most ethical, one of the most happiest, um, and one of the best agents. So you're sort of on the podium at all times when I think of agents in those sorts of areas. So what's your secret? Why do you think like that? Yeah, well, thanks, Mel. That's a pretty glowing wrap. Um, why do I think like that? I think like that because I have a, well, I have a passion for it. I love mm -hmm. the people. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I've, I've also been mentored by my dad and came through from a generational group of real estate agents. Mm -hmm. um, and in that, I think I just wanted to make a difference. Like mm -hmm. I, I really didn't want to be the stock standard agent. I wanted to change the perception of how people might perceive an agent and in doing that, just be consistent, be happy, enjoy what I do. Um, and, you know, I always thought, well, I could, I could do anything I wanted to. If I was going to do real estate, I'd just apply myself, you know, and, and make sure I do it. I did just right. I want people to have a good experience and I want them to, you know, turn into a raving fan at the end. And, um, you know, obviously, you know, you've got to do your best. This, you can't please everybody, but the, the aim is to, is for people to walk away. You can hold your head high and, yep. and have fun doing it, I think is the key. Yeah. So, so I remember here, we've had a few lunches here over the journey. We have. This and is one of our favourite here spots. Here we are at Elwood Bathers uh, in Elwood. Uh, looking out onto the beach, it is one of the best uh, restaurants going around in Melbourne. I believe it's certainly a hidden secret. So in one of those lunches where we might have been having two or three wines or maybe a few more than two or three <laughs> wines and we were discussing the meaning of life and why you were screwing me down on price or something along those lines when I was buying and you were selling, I remember that you were telling me about a particular degree that you did. Um, so... What's your qualification for real estate then, as a matter of yeah. interest? <laughs> well, my qualification was a Bachelor of uh, Arts in Anthropology and Archaeology. Well, of course. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's, uh, Stands every, to reason. Every real estate agent has a Bachelor of Arts in Anthropology and... Anthropology, anthropology. and Archaeology. Okay, so how bit. did you get into that? Why did you get into that and how did you end up in real estate? Obviously had some family history, but... That is a very unusual uh, qualification to go into real estate. It, it is an unusual qualification, one that I never expected to do. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I was um, granted permission into Macquarie University to do arts law. Yep. And at the time I was 17 and it was a bit sort of daunting or difficult to get up there mm -hmm. and, and do it. And I wasn't quite sure that it was the area that I wanted to go into. Mm -hmm. So I thought maybe the best avenue would be to go to Monash in Melbourne, mm -hmm. do an arts degree where I'd been accepted. Mm -hmm and then maybe transition into law if I really liked it. Yeah. And then when I went to enrolment, mm. I was looking around and I saw all these sort of people that looked quite boring. I saw mm. all these fun people mm. queuing up. Yeah. And I jumped on the end of the queue and, I, and when I got to the front of it, I said, what's this? And they said, anthropology. All right. And I said, all right, I'll sign up. And then I, I, when I got home, I rang my cousin and I said, um, she was at, my, at Melbourne Uni. Yeah. I said, Ali, do you know what anthropology is? Yeah. <laughs> she said, it's the study of humankind yeah i thought that actually suits me there you go so i stuck with it loved it yeah uh did uh so a bit of background noise there that's right um yes stuck with it loved it and then also did archaeology i think because i thought i was indiana jones yes <laughs> and uh you know then then that evolved into me doing a professional writing and editing course becoming a copywriter and then and then eventually going into real estate yep yeah so you're not one of those typical boring real estate agents that has really nothing to talk about other than real estate. But this podcast is about real estate. And I, again, just one more question before we get started on five quick questions. What's your sort of mindset in that why you're always positive, always upbeat and never never seem to want to say a bad word about anybody? Yeah, um, my my mindset with that is is always like really clear I, I, I really want to focus on what we do well. Mm. Um, so whether it's me or, or the firm, Chisholm and Gaiman, I'm just really strict and disciplined with it. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't see any reason in it. Mm. I think that, um, well, for example, I've actually had a few clients recently that have signed up from listed their property with mm. us. Mm. And the first thing they've said to me is we've had a phone call or an email from your competitor mm. um, complaining, mm. giving us reasons why they've made the you know, wrong decision. Mm. 
and it leaves a really bad taste in there in the in mm. the mouth of, you mm. know in their mouth and mm. they basically i mean it actually solidifies mm. and justifies mm. the vendor's decision to go with us they mm. often the first thing they say to me mm. is sam i'm so glad we made the decision to go with you we would mm. never deal with them even, mm. even if something even if it didn't sell we'd never yep. go back to them so I guess my philosophy is I always leave the door open. Mm -hmm. um, I'm always upfront with people. I, yep. I give them all of the information that they need to make a decision, mm -hmm. um, and I try and help them with that. I'm not I'm not pushy, but I but I do give what I believe is professional and good advice, mm -hmm. and I'm just consistent with it. I just I just want to be consistent with delivery. Like I, I and I don't want to be one of those people. If I rang somebody and said mm -hmm. I've heard you've had a go a go mm -hmm. of me. Mm -hmm. I don't want them to ever be the person who could bring me in the reverse. Yeah, yeah. I, do, I just don't ever want that. I like to. I like to have a good night's sleep. And yeah, that's it. So you do. You do occasionally think not the best of some people. They do annoy you, but you don't bother yeah. sharing your views with 100%. others on that. Because what, what's the plus? Yeah. Okay, let's get into five quick questions. Let's let's get it moving All where right. we can here. That's right. So, how long have you been in the business? We've already heard what got you in there, but how long have you been in the business? Uh, 22 years. 22 years, and you came from a family background, and I think I think four generations. Fourth generation, yeah. Fourth generation. Okay, kids, families, holidays. Have you got kids? You're married. Where do you go on holidays? That sort of stuff. Uh, yeah. No kids, but yep. a cat named Alfie. Right. Pretty short hair. Yep. He's pretty cute. Yep. Uh, and he's a, he was a COVID baby. Yep. <laughs> He's, he's worked out well. Yeah. Uh, he appears in a few of my cooking uh, yeah, shows. Which we'll discuss. Yeah. And then also um, in terms of family married um, yeah. and uh, my wife uh, works in real estate. So yep. we've got some some good synergy there. And holidays, yes, we're about to go to Europe actually. So we, we try and take we try and take some, some decent breaks because, um, yep. you know, we work hard and sometimes it's six, seven days a week. Right. Um, so make sure I get the balance and that's the reward. Um, we're about to go to... Um, Europe and visit my brother mm -hmm. in Copenhagen, mm -hmm. meet my new niece and yep. my sister's flying in from LA because she lives there yep. for her 40th birthday. So we'll all be sitting down to dinner on my sister's 40th and yeah. Sounds so, fantastic. Lots of travel, yeah. Now, three sentences on Chisholm and Gaiman, which sometimes I've said Chisholm and Gaiman and got into big trouble. So Chisholm and Gaiman, three sentences, please. We're going to run out of tape if I let you go <laughs> for too much more of that. So just Tell us a bit about the company. How many officers? How many people work there? What, what, what's the story? Because you're, you're basically, you're, you're Elwood's focused or, or Elwood as your centre and that's where you are. But, but just tell us a bit about Chisholm and Gaming. Yeah, for sure. So we're a company that's um, around about 50 employees yep. across two offices, Elwood mm -hmm. and Port Melbourne, mm -hmm. and we connect that sort of Bayside corridor. Yep. Um, and it's not that we don't um, we don't stay within that that sort of peri peri mm -hmm. perimeter. Mm -hmm. um, we, we've just sold a property in Caulfield South. We have our client base that takes us in and out of Bayside and Surrounds. Yep. Um, but we do have a Bayside focus, definitely. Elwood, Elwood's been home base. This is yep. actually our 40th year. Yep. Um, so it's natural that that's where probably, you know, the core of the business is. But Port Melbourne has been expanding rapidly mm -hmm. and, um, you know, under the, the great leadership of John Kett and... Yep. And Torsten and obviously I influenced that as well. And, and we've had a really good team there that's building. Um, yep. And it were, well, was rated number one in uh, in the recent ratings for Rate My Agent. So, well, there you yeah. go. Somehow you sneak that in anyway. <laughs> so what's, your, what's, the, what's the biggest deal and the most interesting deal that you've done? Okay, so the biggest deal I've done is $7.25 mm -hmm. which was a house in Elwood that was yep. uh, with a basement. Um, it was once owned by the chef... Tegezard. Yeah. Uh, so we um, we sold that uh, property, um, and at the time, that was the highest price paid for that for that year. Yep. Um, so yeah, very proud of that. That was also one that I connected the buyer and told them about it just before it was hitting the market. So yep. it's just that that also they'd been looking and ringing and saying, "What have you got?" Mm -hmm. um, so that that was a um, exciting sale, uh, and I'll, I'll I'll be sure to beat that soon. But yep. Most memorable deal would be, um, and I've probably talked about this before, but yeah. it was I was selling an apartment in Shelley Street, Elwood, and this guy came past walking with his dog, and it's mm. the classic, oh, mm. somebody just walking in, you're open. Yeah. Are they really interested? Yeah. Just started chatting to him. His yeah. name was David. Started chatting yeah. to him, built up rapport. Yeah. Uh, the next day I did the follow-up call. Yeah. Hi, David, what did you think of the property? And he yeah. said, oh, look, I was just walking the dog. Yeah. But he said, I do own something I'm thinking of selling. Yeah. It turned out to be a mansion on Beaconsfield Parade in right. St Kilda West. Right. This is going back to 2000 and uh, I started in 2001. This was yeah. 2003. Yeah. 
And uh, anyway, at the, it was called Shandon and mm-hmm. it had been operating as a sort of an Airbnb type mm-hmm. boutique accommodation. Mm-hmm. And uh, anyway, he gave me the listing mm-hmm. and he gave it to me for 30 days. Mm-hmm. I sold it on the 29th day. Well done. <laughs> and there was other agents breathing down his neck. Yeah. And uh, we sold it for four million, which yep. was a record price at and, the time. Well, geez, that would have to be thinking twelve approximately now, at least. Well, now yeah. it's amazing because that's yeah. where that's where the story gets a little bit more interesting. Yeah, the guy who bought it yeah. then said to me, "Who owns the block of flats behind me?" Right, and uh, he actually. Um, he, we had to find out who that was. It turned yeah. out, luckily, it was on one ownership. Yeah. He bought that as well. Right. Knocked it down for more garden. Yeah. And then um, we had, there was an old stables in the building yeah. next door to him. Yep. And he wanted some wine storage and he bought that as well. And I had yeah. to, so we ended up doing multiple deals. That was a pretty happy little dog walking past meeting. But yeah, yes, and even the vendor, David, I've since sold four properties for him yeah. just but, from the dog chat. Yeah, and I know why that would have happened. That would have happened because of your disposition, uh, your work ethic, and, and and what I believe that they would have seen into your uh, ethics. So your biggest indulgence outside work and family is? Cooking. Of course. <laughs> uh, yeah. So everybody, I, well, many people within our industry would have seen your um, episodes, especially during COVID, entertained an awful lot of people. Um, tell us a little bit about cooking, why you got into that and why it's so important to you, because it obviously is. Yeah, cooking is just something that's a great sort of stress release for me. You know, if you have a big, long day and you come mm. home, it, it, it takes your mind into another place, mm. something that I love to do. Um, I love food and eating as well, but mm. it's, it's part of that, I guess, that process and it's just it's something I enjoy. And it really stems from my grandmother, mm. um, well, both my grandmothers really. Um, mm. You know, we, we used to go around after school and it was as simple as like baking scones or an apple pie or helping them do the roast dinner on a Saturday. Whatever it was, um, you know, they sort of taught me how to cook and, yep. and it was spending that time with them as well, you know, and engaging. And I think that's what I like. It sort of brings people together because, mm. um, you know, if you cook something, you know, like a big paella or something mm. like that, you can, you can you know, bring it to people and they can enjoy it. And so I think it's like it's a sort of sharing thing. It's a it's it's a. And that's your favourite dish, paella, that you love doing? I do love doing that. It features a lot on, on my Instagram. It does. It does. <laughs> but that, that and lasagna and oh, there's a heap of fun. What is your Instagram if we get to this stage? And we'll put it down the bottom uh, on, on, the, uh, on the YouTube anyway. Yeah. What is your Instagram? Uh, that's an easy one. It's just at Sam Gaiman. So, right. Yeah, oh, good. So, yeah, easy to find. And what's your tip then? So on cooking, we'll finish up on cooking now. But what's your, what's your for people that want to sort of get into cooking or thinking about cooking and maybe they're even real estate agents and they want to entertain some people, what would be your number one tip in cooking? Uh, I think number one tip would be great produce and simplicity. Mm-hmm. It doesn't need to be overcomplicated. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and I used to say put a little teaspoon of Vegemite into the into the um, bolognese. Yeah, I've, I've since changed that to bacon. Right. So, <laughs> but uh, yeah, there's plenty of tips, but keep it simple. Okay. Yeah. Let's move on to ethics. I think you're somebody that. Uh, whose ethics I certainly align with and feel comfortable with, and obviously a lot of people do because you haven't sort of said it 68 times, but you would be one of Victoria's top salespersons, so um, well done. Um, And you do that with what I would consider an an excellent ethical background or ethical mindset. So what does ethics look like to you? What do you think ethics means? Uh, I think ethics means that you are true to your word, Mm -hmm. uh, that, that that people can trust in what you're saying and what you're doing. Yep. Uh, that you are, res- you know, responsible. Mm-hmm. That you're caring. Mm-hmm. Um, that you're diligent. Um, uh, you're honest. Mm. Um, I'm not sure if I said that before. Mm. And and that you don't let somebody um, move you into a position that you're uncomfortable with. Yep. If you know it's wrong, mm-hmm. you, you stick your ground. Yep. And what's your general assessment of agents as our or sort of what's your general assessment of our industry as an ethical bunch? Uh, I think it's a mixed bag. Yeah. Um, you know, I think it's a mixed bag. I think we we have work to do still, um, yeah. but I think that there are a number of great professionals. Yeah. Um, that and they're the ones that I think you gravitate mm. towards. Mm. Um, but there's probably a reason why if you're selecting somebody mm. to do a, mm. a, a vendor advocacy, mm. um, there's probably a reason why you pick them. Mm. And there's certain ones that I'm sure that you wouldn't pick. Correct. Um, mm. And so my, my feeling is that some people are probably self-interested or they're just interested in 
being transactional. Mm. Um, that's not that's not my interest. Mm. Um, so I think we've still got a bit of work to do, but I, I do think as an industry we're getting a lot better because there's so much accountability, there's reviews online, mm. like there's a lot of visibility. Mm. Um, so it's it's hard to stay under the radar doing the wrong thing for for. For a long time, I agree. I think I think the uh, people say, and especially in in bigger countries and things like that, you know, the press light except shines a light on on corruption in some way, shape, or form. And while we do bag our press uh, occasionally, deservedly, um, we also um, do need them because they do highlight a, a lot of issues, and, and not just the press, even even just those sort of rate my agents and all those sorts of things. There are and, and Instagram, etc. There are more and more voices out there that. If you're consistently doing the wrong thing, if somebody's doing some research, they should be able to find out yeah. about that agent relatively easy. So in your company, you said it's about 50. How, how do you ensure transparency and honesty with, you know, how do you ensure transparency and honesty in the dealings of other people at work for you? Uh, that comes down to really corporate culture. Mm -hmm. um, and I suppose the leadership team you know, direct that. Mm -hmm. um, we also have a very open office. So mm. effectively, like for years, I've, I've sat next door to Torsten, but mm. now everybody sits together. Mm. And you, the conversations um, that we have mm. are very much, um, are, are very much sort of guided towards people being a, a Chisholm and Gaiman way, if you like. Like mm. if, if you imagine our colours orange, mm. like if people, we would say it's like an orange family. Mm. Um, so... Really, what we're doing is making sure that that message is passed through, yep, and that everybody knows it. And and really, we don't want to take a passenger mm. that's not, you know, going to be connected. Connected, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think what you're saying in a roundabout sort of way, sort of cultural, is one thing, but that comes from leadership. And look, our industry and the companies that people deal with, it, it is about leadership. And if there is the right leadership at the top, um, well, then basically that that will filter down. Uh, in the rest of the company. And if there's the wrong leadership at the top and people are blaming the, the sort of junior burgers, um, I think they really need to be looking at the leadership because that's where the fish, what is it, the fish rots at the head or something along those lines on the negatives. Yeah. But on yeah. the positives, um, you know, where there's where there's good leadership and good understanding of culture, et cetera, things can go well. Yeah, yeah. So we, we're very unified in the sense that we have, um, you know, obviously our property management meetings and our sales meetings, but we also you know, have WhatsApp groups where we communicate with one another mm. and there's a lot of internal accountability and mm. I think that that's what really keeps it as a co cohesive group mm. um, and, and a group that still has a lot of fun. Um, mm. But they all they all know that sometimes you might have to walk away from something. If, yep. if you're not aligned, if you feel like the, it's not, if, if you feel like it's not aligned, then, you know, it's not worth it. Like, yeah. Yeah. Here's an interesting one. It happened to me this week and it's probably one of the more difficult ones that I've been involved in lately and it's, it, 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 I think it'll be a good example about how you prioritise the best interests of your clients. So, had an example, had an agreement on price. We were representing, we we're a vendor advocacy work here. An agent had brought to us a particular price. We basically agreed on that price that we thought that's where things were going and we didn't make any other contact. Before we'd signed, another agent comes in and says, I'm going to give you a higher price. That was not initiated by us, uh, it just came straight in. And then I, I rang, the, the, rang our client, the vendor, and said, what would you like us to do? And they said look, I think you should look and listen to their price. So we did, and that caused a fair bit of angst for the buyer, uh, but that's what the seller instructed. Uh, and uh, that then we, we then went into a backwards and forwards situation and, and, and it did produce a significantly higher price. It did leave a pretty negative taste in the, in the buyer's, the original buyer's sort of mouth and the agent. And I would understand that they're not happy with me, but... When you're in those situations, um, you know how would you how would you deal with these things? How how do you because there are times when it's not black and white. It's just well, it's grey. And 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 what do you do in those circumstances? Yeah, I, I think clear communication. Mm -hmm. um, so whenever I'm speaking to a purchaser, mm -hmm. I will tell them that if we get to an agreement on price, mm -hmm. that it's subject to no higher offer, mm -hmm. and that until the contract's signed and exchanged. Mm -hmm. There's nothing that, that's connecting the, yeah. the buyer and the seller. Yeah. Um, and then we generally set a deadline for other offers mm -hmm. and then we just make that deadline clear. Mm -hmm. So the, once we hit that deadline, if we've communicated acceptance, yeah. the, the other buyers are told it's sold. Yeah. So that, that's effectively how we handle that process. Yeah. Um, and that, that we've found that that avoids 
the angst. Yep. Um, I've been on the other side. I, mm. I once tried to purchase a property mm. and I won't say from which agent because mm. it mm. goes to the grain of mm. not bagging other agents. Yep. But, um, and that happened to me. Mm. And I, I, it left a very bad taste. Mm. And so I try and avoid those situations. Yep. Setting it up as best you can. Mm. Like we all know that there are there's unexpected in real estate um, and, you know, you've got to be prepared for that. But we try our hardest to, to put people on a, a, a playing field where they know what the rules of engagement are and what's going to happen. I, I agree. I think upon, as I've reflected upon it, I think I didn't, uh, I didn't explain that situation well enough uh, because I didn't see a possibility of being another <laughs> party coming in and yeah. out of the blue and just saying that. Yeah. Uh, and I, I, think I, I think I've got to be a little bit better myself next time. Um, I do think we went down the right track, uh, but, yeah, it's not. It's something that I'm, I wish I'd probably handled slightly better. That's all I yeah, and I, I think we've all been in that situation once, and then, yeah. and then you just analyse it and you say, mm. right, what can we do differently? Mm. Um, I've, I've definitely had. I've had that situation. Mm. And that's what made me kind of rethink how yeah. I communicate. Yeah. Let's go into daily routines. Daily routines of a top performing but decent real estate agent. Now I couldn't find anybody, so I've got nothing, <laughs> Jamie. <laughs> I'm going with you, Sam. So, what, what's what's your daily routines like? What do you do in the morning? What do you do in the afternoon? What do you do in the evening? And what do you do in your days off? And you know, how do you think? And yeah, so um, morning is always exercise. Yep. Yeah, um, pretty much every day. Mm -hmm. So it might be personal training in Brighton. We run into each other rest. occasionally now and again. When I get a coffee. That's right. I'm not doing any personal training. <laughs> I'm getting the coffee. That's where I run into you at. But, I, do yeah. run, I do see you at the cafe there. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, personal training, which is good, and I've got some friends that do it with me, mm. so I, I find that really social, uh, and and it just really, really gets me set up the right way. Um, walking, mm -hmm. so I might do between six and eight kilometres of walking on the days when I'm not personal training. Yep. And swimming because I like to do the Peter Pub swim every year. Yep. In Lawn, mm -hmm. so I like to keep out up there in the swim. water at the moment. Yeah. I would not be in there. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. I'm not one of those icebergers. I'm no. just not game. I like. Yeah. I like a warm pool. Warm bath. Yeah. That's where you do your swimming. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I, I love that actually because it's one of the only times I disconnect from my phone. Yep. And apart from this podcast, yeah. <laughs> uh, so it's it's a good time to sort of think and reset. And yep. Yeah. So or exercise in the morning. Yep. Um, and then yeah, get into get into work. I like to you know make calls pretty quickly. I like to get into. What time would you get into work approximately? Uh, it used to be it varies a little bit because I I see myself as working. I'm pretty much working from anywhere from. 7.30 yeah. onwards, really. Yep. But I don't physically go into the office then. I used to. Yeah. But now with the way that we work and we communicate via mm. phones, iPads. Zooms. Zooms. Mm. To, yeah. All of those things. I just think it's been a game changer. It's actually yep. been a lot better for me since yep. COVID. Yeah. I think the balance of being in and out of the office. Yep. still important to me for being in the office because I, I want to be around the team and I love yep. the buzz. Yep. And, and we share information you know, sort of, um, we discuss things and yep. we strategize, and I, th I think that's how do we, how do we sort of get through this situation? Yep. We problem solve, you know, all of those things. But yeah, so I, I typically get in the office probably about you know nine. Yep. And then, uh, and then I and then I typically hit the phone. So, but it varies on the day yep. as to what I'm doing. Yep. So Mondays might be following up all the buyers early in the morning. The afternoon might be mm. dealing with vendors. Yep. Yeah. Okay, you can probably hear a bit of noise now because we're starting to get into the busier times here at the restaurant. But that's all right. We might have to just talk a little bit louder as we go through things. What about the what about your evenings? What do your evenings look like? So evenings typically consist of cooking. Yeah. <laughs> so my, most nights I'm I'm cooking at home. I yep. suppose. Yep. Um, hanging out with Alfie and Kate. Yep. And uh, and then you know trying to get a, a mixture of either listening to music. Um, Watching TV, yep. you know, whatever it is to kind of unwind a little yep. bit. Uh, so try and try and get a little bit of balance there, and, yep. and then obviously if there's work to do, I, I, I fit it in. Yeah, and yeah. sort of your weekly plan. So do you have sort of Mondays you're making calls, Tuesdays you're doing visits, Wednesday you got open for inspections, that sort of thing. That's you're yeah. fairly typical as most agents are on that sort of uh, routine. Absolutely, except the major difference for me is I work Saturdays and Sundays. So right. Friday, like yeah. today is my that's yeah. my day off. So it's very nice of you to come yeah, in here and do this. I was excited. Oh, good. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's typically the week, and in and in terms of obviously, there's also the 
the fact that I love to go out to dinner or socialise with clients or friends. So yep. I, I, I fit that in as well. How do you prioritise what you're going to do for the day? Do you get up in the morning and go through a list and do this, this and this? Or do you just take it as it comes and, you know, nah, nah, yes, nah. Or do you have somebody who prioritises your day for you? Yeah, so I, I prioritise, um, but I also have... Um, Obviously, you know, support around me. Yep. And great support. Yep. So in terms of in terms of how I prioritise though, I will look at what's coming up mm-hmm. and what we needed to do from the day before, um, in terms of maybe whether it's appraisals or getting back with people with what their place is worth. And yep. Whether it's a strategy on for auction, mm-hmm. whether it's setting up an auction meeting, pre auction meeting, whatever that is. Um, and then I might catch up with the team and yep. sit down and, and say, right, what do we need to do? Mm. Who's going to do what? And then we, we prioritise it that way. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Communications. Let's just go through communications. Um, a lot of communications that I see from real estate agents, to be honest, I mean, um, chat GPT will be a big positive because at least it'll be interesting. Most of the real estate agent communication, I believe, is poor. Uh, it's, it's generic. Uh, it doesn't show any great interest. Uh, in anything, it just shows, well, do this, do that. If it's A, do B. If it's B, do C. And, you know, AI is not going to uh, affect their business. AI will take over their business yeah. because they, they, all they do at the moment is robotic sort of stuff. And they don't tend to be the, the quality agents. Mm. There, There is a level of, of, of roboticness or routineness. We've all got to have that. But I'm talking about the communication, the key communications. How do you how do you communicate to a to a seller uh, and a buyer at the at the critical times, which is either listing or, or transaction? What, what what's in your mind? Uh, well, I'm a mixture. I love face to face still. Yep. I, I do also communicate via Microsoft Teams or Zoom. Yep. Um, so obviously you've got to pick and choose what those situations are like. Um, phone and WhatsApp groups, but in terms of the actual communication, they're all the the different ways you can communicate but in terms of the communication i I think of everything every i think of everything uh on its own merits and Mm -hmm. i try and look at every situation or every every campaign differently Mm -hmm. so not generically and i try and look to see right is 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 everything going well is there something we need to tweak is there a blockage Mm. what can you know can we do anything differently to kind of get a different outcome what's gonna what what and then also providing information back to either the purchaser or the vendor. Um, and when if it's a vendor, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not just relying on telling them there's three groups that have come through yeah. and two contract requests mm-hmm. and leave it at that. Yeah. You know, I want to drill down into the right questions for the buyers so I can give them informed information. I want to tell them what's happening in the market, yep. what else has been transacting, why things are, may, may or may not sell. And really delve into it, but I, I look at everything as a sort of a, you know, it's it's like moving things around a chessboard. You, you, you need to be clever and strategic, and you need to really think about it, and not just put every property into one box. Like it's just not the way it works. I agree totally, and I think that's what you do well, and I think that's what some of the other agents that we've interviewed in this process, uh, sorry, in the in these podcasts, uh, do well, and that is that there, there's the routine and the routine that are handed by the junior burgers. Um, but there's also, at the, at the critical times, that's when a, a, a high-quality agent steps in and exactly as you said, they look at how they can connect and they look beyond the, the obvious to see if there's some other way and they look for blockages, as you say, and they preempt them. You know, yes, manage, management yeah. of expectations for many agents means get the price as low as you possibly can and exceed it by as much as possible. I mean, look, it's a reasonable theory, but it tends to make our industry look a little bit poor because basically there's a little bit of lying involved in that situation. Um, but the really high quality agents, especially at the top end, do do the connection. Just one more word on that. How do you th- how do you connect a buyer and a seller? Well, that's a good point. So. I don't wait for the buyer. Now, what I mean is by saying that is that um, if I feel I can match make somebody to a property, mm-hmm. that's that's one element. Mm-hmm. But also, if a buyer comes through and likes a property, but then says to me they they don't align with the price, mm. or you know they're not seeing value at that level, mm. or if there's something in the title that's unusual and needs explanation. Mm. What I will do is not just wait for them to come back to me. Like I'm going to find a reason to overcome their objection. Mm -hmm. And look, they may not always agree with it, but at least I can walk away from that that situation knowing that I've tried. Yep. And so I'm just very proactive, not reactive. 
yep. that, that's 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 the key in my mind. I agree. La- last little sort of subject before we finish off, uh, what you love about what you do. So this is the, that sort of section is what what is the aspect of real estate that brings you the most fulfilment, the, the most joy. Uh, I think people really. Yep. Um, I, I guess over the journey, so many of my clients have become, um, you know, either friends or repeat business. Mm-hmm. And so I don't see it as, as just business. I see it as like we've always we had a mantra of it's business and it's pleasure. Yeah. So I, I just think people is, is obviously a key thing. And, and that, I could, to give you an example, it's the joy that comes out of it is it's the little one percenters mm-hmm. that develop into something that you didn't expect them to, to that we're yep. going to, you know, develop. Um, it's it's that planting a seed and then yeah. down the track something comes from it. Yeah. And to give you one example, very quickly, we had a lady who used to come into our office and ask for free copy, free photocopying yeah. back in the day when you had to pay for it. Yeah. News agency, yeah. and and uh, Dad always, you know, let her run a few things yeah. over the photocopier. Yeah. Never charged her. Yeah. And then um, when Dad sort of semi-retired, she used yeah. to come and ask for me and yeah. I'd, I'd say, yeah, go yeah. for it. Yeah. Never had any business out of it. Yeah. Um, 15 years later, she rings me and says that her next door neighbor is going into a home mm. and she's told her that she can only sell her property with me. Mm. And I went and met the, the, the owner and her daughter at the mm. nursing home. Mm. We signed up the authority. We mm. signed it for $2.8 million. Wow. Um, and, uh, you know, I just think about those little things. That yeah. Just... just you know, sometimes you, you don't expect anything. But well, on what you charge, that certainly would cover the photocopying yeah. at least anyway. <laughs> yeah. So, no, you're not too bad. You're, you're, you're fine on the charging there. So, repeat business. You brought, I think we'd sort of finish with that. Um, repeat business is really important. Repeat business is not important if you're a crook. Repeat business is not important if you're unethical because you won't get repeat business. But I think I read something like 95%, was it? I saw some number yeah, in your it's advertising. Over, it's over 90%. Yeah, over 90% and, of and your I, work is repeat business. Yeah. It's the same for us. If yeah. I look back upon this year, I, I mean, it's nice to do market news and Google and people can find us and all that sort of stuff, but practically every single job we get is is repeat business. So what, what's the importance of repeat business then in your mind and how, how do you get it? How do you keep it? Uh, the importance of it is that it, it, it means that you're an attraction agent yeah. um, so that, you know, uh, you need to stay relevant, you need to stay fresh and you need to be in front of people. Mm. But it, it means that you're a natural choice or at yeah. least you're at the starting line. Mm. Um, you know, at least you're in the, you, you might be in the, the, the top two that they might mm. be interviewing. You yeah. might, they may not have to interview as many agents. They, they may not interview anybody. Mm. Um, yesterday I went and walked into a house that I'd sold to the couple mm. And they signed up mm. same day. Mm. Um, you know, didn't speak to anybody else because mm-hmm. they felt a level of trust. Mm-hmm. They felt it had a good experience in the first instance. Yep. Um, and so that to me is that's that's really critical. Um, I want people to walk away feeling they had a, a you know a good experience in the transaction, mm. and that they understand that I've worked hard. Mm. Um, as a purchaser, they need to understand I work for the vendor. But yes. that then turns into them being a vendor in the future. Yep. So if they've seen that I've worked hard in the negotiation, yep. they know that I'll do it for them. Hard but fair. Hard but fair. Yep. How, how do you find that balance and how do you communicate and nurture the repeat business? Because you must have a, a strategy and a system for that. Otherwise, well, all your business wouldn't be repeat business. Uh, I do. I'm, I guess part of it, um, obviously, is you know anniversaries and making sure that you're congratulating people mm. on the fact that they've been there for five years. Yeah. And, and getting getting in touch with them at those regular touch points, yep. so that you're not over um, stimulating them, I mm. suppose, yep. um, or annoying them. Yeah. Uh, and then, I've, and then obviously, there's other uh, touch points, whether it's you know follow ups from just you know a, a six monthly check in or whatever it is to, to get back in touch with them and see how they're going. Mm. Um, but but important to understand, you know, be respectful with with that with I guess those times. Mm. I'm lucky or fortunate, not lucky, but I've worked hard for it. Mm. Fortunate in the sense that I'm at a point in my career mm. where there's that natural sort of people gravitate towards yep. phoning me. Yeah, and I'm also we're part of a community. So Elwood is um, very much a community based area where. We support a whole lot of local clubs. Mm. We're, we're involved. Mm. Everybody knows each other in the village. I live in Elwood. Mm. I sell in Elwood. Mm. Twenty-two years of, in one mm. place. Mm. So, I'm, and I walk around in bright pink shorts. So I'm yeah. very when I'm out walking. So I'm very it is visible. embarrassing for others, but we won't go yeah. there. Yeah, go on. So I'm very visible, yeah. um, and you know, part of that community. So 
It's a it's a hard one to put a tangible on Mel because yeah. I can I can walk down the street mm. and talk to five potential vendors yeah. in fifteen minutes. Yeah. And it's not actually picking up the phone and hassling yep. them. Mm. It's just asking them about, you know, how it's they're being like, local in your community. Yeah. 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 Well, I think on that wonderful note, and I will just ask you to say who you are and where you are and your phone numbers and all that, but on that wonderful note, I think you've just taught me something. It's when I'm actually out with friends or when I'm out with whoever I'm out with, I, I no longer am going to be annoying them. I am overstimulating them. <laughs> so I, 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 that is a fantastic learning experience for me. And yeah, you were you changing the narrative for that, you. That's right. I really, really appreciate that. So, Sam. If somebody wants to uh, find out who the best real estate agent is in uh, Elwood, well, I can tell them that's you. So how do they contact you? Uh, they contact me via mobile on 0425-702-574 or they contact me via my email, which is sam at chismgaiman.com.au. Uh, and do you need me to spell that out? or Yeah, why not? Uh, so Sam at C-H-I-S-H-O-L-M-G-A-M-O-N.com.au. No worries. Um, or obviously on my Instagram, at Sam Gaiman. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Sam. Yeah, it's been thanks, a really, good, a really enjoyable. Yeah. Thank you. Great time. Thank so, you. Yeah, thank you.